Good evening, ooky spooky people of the interwebs. If this is my first time appearing on your screen, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Alexa, the resident gothic fairy, and we've all gathered here today to discuss which horrors that never really should have happened. Look, as somebody who dresses how I do, doesn't believe in a singular male god, and is queer, I would have been put through the ringer back in the time of witch trials. Most women accused of being witches were honestly just local healers, women who had a mind of their own, and just overall independent folks who intimidated others to the point of hysteria. Well, we all know that witches would have their lives ended by ways of the rope necklace, public burning, or other forms of execution. Today shall be more about the ways of punishment and interrogation. An honorable mention that didn't make today's list was sleep deprivation, because goodness knows in modern times, enough of us do that to ourselves on a regular basis myself included. While many of these could lead to death themselves, history claims that it was never the intent, so I shall look forward to debates from y'all in the comments section. Alrighty, enough jibber jabber from me. Time for the top 5 worst punishments used during the Salem Witch Trials. In 5th place we have witch cakes to kick us off. Sadly these aren't yummy Halloween cakes, a thought which makes me very hungry, <laughs> but instead a bizarre form of counter magic, a supernatural dessert used to identify suspected evildoers. In cases of mysterious illness or possession, witch hunters would take a sample of the victim's urine, mix it with rye meal and ashes and bake it into a cake. This stomach turning concoction was then fed to a familiar or animal helper of the suspected witch in the hopes that the creature would fall under its spell and reveal the name of the guilty sorcerer. During the hysteria that preceded the Salem witch trials, Tichuba famously helped prepare a witch cake to identify the person responsible for bewitching young Betty Paris and others. The brew failed to work, and Tichuba's knowledge of spells and folk remedies was later used as evidence against her when she was accused of being a witch. Before I forget, another use for a witch cake came from burning the pastry in hopes that the scorching heat would transfer to the witch and force her to reveal herself. Whew. Anybody else starting to get warm? Oh great, just me. In fourth place, we have a scold's bridal. Also known as a witch's bridal, a gossip's bridal, a brink's bridal, or simply brinks, this was an instrument of punishment as a form of public humiliation. This thing was an iron muzzle in an iron framework that enclosed the head. Some exceptions were masks that depicted suffering, but not pleasant either way. My brain just jumped to a similar modern device used for pleasure instead of pain, and no, I will not elaborate on that thought, but let's clarify. A bridal bit, or curb plate, around 5 centimeters by 2.5 centimeters in size, was slid into the mouth and pressed down on top of the tongue, often with a spike on the tongue as a compress. A function to silence the wearer from speaking entirely, and caused extreme pain and physiological trauma to scare and intimidate the wearer into submission. This prevented speaking and resulted in many unpleasant side effects for the wearer, including excessive salivation and fatigue in the mouth. Seeing as I have always been a chatty Cathy, I can totally see how I would have been sentenced to this, and my jaw hurts just thinking about it. The wearer was then led around the town by a leash, and for extra humiliation, a bell could also be attached to um, draw in crowds. First recorded in Scotland in 1567, the brinks were also used in England and its colonies. The Kirk Sessions and Barony Courts in Scotland inflicted the contraption mostly on female transgressors, and women considered to be rude, nags, common scolds, drunken, but mostly witches. It was also used as corporal punishment for other offenses, notably on female workhouse inmates. The person to be punished was placed in a public place for additional humiliation and sometimes beaten. Just sometimes, not every time apparently. Knowing what I know about history and cover-ups, I'm going to lean towards probably most of the time. The Lanark Berg records record a typical example of the punishment being used. When wearing the device, it was, yep, impossible for the person to either eat or speak. Other pranks included an adjustable gag with a sharp edge, causing any movement of the mouth to result in laceration of the tongue. In Scotland, pranks could also be permanently displayed in public by attaching them, for example, to the town cross, tron, or toll booth. Then the ritual humiliation would take place, with the miscreant on public display. Displaying the pranks in public was intended to remind the populace of the consequences of any rash action or slander. Whether the person was paraded or simply taken to the point of punishment, the process of humiliation and expected repentance was the same. Time spent in the brittle was normally allocated by the Kirk Session, in Scotland or by a local magistrate. In third place we have a ducking chair, not to be confused with a cucking chair, which is a whole other concept, or the red hot stools women accused to having sexual acts with the devil would have to sit on. I sadly don't have enough information to unpack that stool, other than ouch, but um, let's get on with the ducking shall we? The ducking stool was a strongly made wooden armchair, often made out of oak, in which the offender was seated, with an iron band being placed around them so that they would uh, not fall out during their immersion. How 
thorough. The earliest record of the use of such is towards the beginning of the 17th century, with the term first being attested in English in 1597. It was used both in Europe and in the English colonies of North America. Usually the chair was fastened to a long wooden beam fixed as like a seesaw on the edge of a pond or river. And as much as I love and miss wooden playgrounds, I feel like this might not have been as fun. Sometimes the ducking stool was not a fixture, but was mounted on a pair of wooden wheels so that it could be wheeled through the streets, and at the river edge was hung by a chain from the end of a beam. In sentencing a woman, the magistrates ordered the number of ducking she should have, and as much as I've scoured the internet, I can't seem to find number data on this. If you have any ideas, please let me know in the comments. Another type of ducking stool was called a tumbrel, and was a chair on two wheels with two long shafts fixed to the axles. This was pushed into the pond, and then the shafts would be released, ergo tipping the chair up backwards. Sometimes the punishment proved fatal and the subject died. Once again, the um, sometimes, should be taken with a pound of salt. In medieval times until the early 18th century, ducking was a way used to establish whether a suspect was a witch. The ducking stools were first used for this purpose, but ducking was later inflicted without the chair. In this instance, the subject's right thumb was bound to her left big toe, her left thumb to her right big toe, a rope was tied around the waist of the accused, and she was thrown into a river or a deep pond. If she floated, it was deemed that she was in league with the devil, rejecting the baptismal water. If she sank, she was cleared. Oh, and she'd be dead. Can't forget that part. Silly me. In second place, we have witch mark hunting and pricking. Witch hunters often had their suspects stripped and publicly examined for signs of an unsightly blemish that witches were said to receive upon making their pact with Satan. This devil's mark had supposedly changed shape and color and was believed to be numb and insensitive to pain. Prosecutors might also search for the witch's teat, which was an extra nipple allegedly used to suckle the witch's helper animals. In both cases, it was really easy for even the most minor physical imperfections to be labeled as the work of the devil himself. Oh my, the horror. Moles, scars, birthmarks, sores, and tattoos could all qualify. So examiners really came up empty handed. I'm trying to think of just how many birthmarks I have all over my body. So just add that to the tally of how I'm, you know, a witch. Seriously, I feel the burning from the flames already. In the midst of witch hunts, desperate villagers would sometimes even burn or cut off any offending marks on their bodies, only to have their wounds labeled as proof of a covenant with the devil. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. If I'm adding like scars to my blemish count, yeah, forget it. Okay, I think the temperature in here just went up another couple of degrees. Seriously. If witch hunters struggled to find obvious evidence of witch's marks on a suspect's body, they might resort to the ghastly practice of pricking as a means of, you know, sussing it out. Come on! Even having a flawless body isn't going to exonerate you? What the heck? Witch hunting books and instructional pamphlets noted that the marks were insensitive to pain and couldn't bleed, so examiners used specially designed needles to repeatedly stab and prick at the accused person's flesh until they discovered a spot that produced the desired results. In England and Scotland, the punishment was eventually performed by well-paid professional prickers, many of whom were actually con men who used adult needle points to identify fake witches' marks. Well then, if you ever feel like your job just, you know, isn't real, remember that people in history were paid to do well. Along with pricking, the unfortunate suspect might also be subjected to scratching by their supposed victims. This test was based on the notion that possessed people found relief by scratching the person responsible with their fingernails until they um, drew fluid. If their symptoms improved after clawing at the accused skin, it was seen as partial evidence of guilt. No, no, absolutely not. I can't see anyone being proven innocent whatsoever from this nonsense. Talk about a bite. Court. In first place, we have dismemberment and mutilation. This is where my own stomach gets all topsy turvy, so fair warning. I can handle creepy stuff, no problem. But gore? There is a reason I haven't been able to bring myself to watch the Terror Fire movies. So, when witch hunters wanted to get answers back in the day, if I haven't made it clear enough by now, they didn't really care about being humane or, you know, coercion, just being right. They would do whatever they deemed necessary to get a confession, leading many witches to confess just to make the pain stop and end their lives, well, Humanely, say goodbye to your fingernails because that was practically just a footnote in what they were allowed to do. While Perga Hosmanin of Bavaria was led through multiple different stages of mutilation while being paraded to her execution. At the first stop, her left breast and right arm were branded with irons, then her right breast at the second stop, her left arm at the third, with her left hand being then branded at the fourth stop. Once they reached the place of execution, her right hand, with uh, which she had made her oath as a midwife, was cut off before she was finally burned alive at the stake. Oh, her ashes were not allowed to remain on soil. 
but they were just, you know, dumped in a stream. Probably the most extreme extent of this was a punishment normally reserved for killers, but exceptions were made for witches who confessed without torture to crimes deemed brutal enough for it. Are y'all ready for this? The offender would be strapped to four horses, with one arm or leg attached to each separate horse, and then on command, the horses would start running and rip the offender's arms and legs off. The person would die somehow, and painfully through life source and uh, limb loss. And on that note, we've reached the end of our time. As much as I joke about wanting to time travel, I'm glad. I live in the age I do where I can exist truthfully without worrying about being sent through a witch trial for living as um, I am. I adore my witchy friends and I am so glad they can exist in peace without being tried as well. As always, let me know in the comments if anyone thinks I missed you know, a specific form of punishment I should have touched on and don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the bell for more witchy goodness and more from us here at Top 5 Scary Videos.